Hello everyone, my name is Louise and in this video I'm going to walk you through how I sculpted this sword guard in VR using Substance 3D Modeler. Quick caveat before we begin, you can follow along with Modeler in desktop, but some actions might take more time or be harder to perform with a mouse or a tablet. Also, if you are completely new to Modeler, I would suggest you maybe watch this intro series first to get to know the basics of the interface. In this short series, we will not only sculpt, but go over all the steps of an asset's creations from sculpting, to texturing, and finally rendering. All of this without leaving the Substance ecosystem. For this project, I used this magnificent Chinese sword hilt from the Metropolitan Museum as a reference. I didn't stick super closely to it, but it was my guide throughout the whole process, and I'll be referring to it from time to time. As I'm recording this tutorial, Modler doesn't import reference images yet. It should come in time, but for now you have to go through Oculus pinning system, which is not so easy, so let me show you how to do it. The first thing you want to do is to open the image you want in your image viewer. Now put your headset back, and to access your image you need to bring up the Oculus dashboard. You do so by long pressing the Oculus button on your tool hand. Now here's the trick. You have to scroll up to the far right of your dashboard until you see that plus button over here. Click on it, then select your image viewer. Of course you can do it with any window, it's up to you, but traditional reference boards might not be supported by the Oculus. Now your Windows is displayed, but you still need to place it. You do this by pressing the grip of your tool hand and adjusting the distance with the joystick. Then, to pin it, it's not super visible, but you have a little pin icon on the bottom right of the window. Click on it, and you're good to go. So let's begin. The first thing we want to do is to block out the lion's oval. Marlow is great for that because it comes with parametric primitives that will give you a head start with your sculpt. In this case, I'm starting with a sphere that I flatten to get closer to the main profile. Now we need to roughly shape the forehead and jaw, and with symmetry enabled, we can use the warp tool to do that. Gently pulling out the clay, playing with the warp size. It's such a versatile tool, you can achieve a lot with it, especially in VR where you can twist clay like what I'm doing here, for example. Pushing the lip bow in. All right, good enough. Now that we have a solid base, it's time to give it more depth by adding new layers of clay. I'm going to use a sphere primitive once more. And notice that by doing so, I have created a new layer, which means I can work on it without affecting the rest, that is now a darker shade of brown. You can scope in and out of a layer at any time with the left joystick. Here, for example, I jump back to my previous layer to quickly fix a few things. Now I'd like to show you a neat trick to create the muscles and creases of the face. Instead of carving them out in the face layer itself, I'm going to duplicate the layer. And so what I can do is start pulling out muscles. Now to make it work even better, you can push that duplicate layer down and bury it, so to say, underneath your main layer. And now if I start pulling, you can really see the magic of it. I can efficiently add volume to my sculpt. Now working on the duplicate layers allow me to clearly see the effect of what I'm doing, but also to have sharper transitions. A bit like if I was working with masks. And see here the power of VR? Twisting clay with a simple rotation of my hand. Really efficient. Now let's repeat that operation, duplicating once more our base layer and moving it down. And once again, pulling out clay. Trying to flesh out those temples. And so on, you get the idea. Now let's tackle the nose. Starting with an elongated sphere and placing it in gizmo mode. By the way, just a few words about that. In VR, you can choose between freehand mode and gizmo mode. Freehand placement will attach whatever tool you have selected to your tool hand whereas gizmo mode will give you axis control, just like in desktop. All right, so this time I'm using the warp in capsule mode to have something longer to work with. Using the eraser to finish the shape and then smoothing the sharp edges with the smooth tool. 
For the nose holes, I could have used a razor as well, but I find that warping often gives better results for small cavities like this. The warp tool also comes with a square mode that's great to sharpen edges, just like that. Now let's talk about the wispy ornaments that cover the lion's face. We can apply the same logic to them, starting from adjusted primitives and then warping them into place. Let's place them roughly where we want them and switch to warp mode. Twisting. To make the swirly bits stick out the ornaments, we need to duplicate those so that we can warp them without disrupting the main band. Like so. And now all we have to do is a bit of cleanup with the eraser. We'll merge everything later. So making swirl is not easy because you really have to push the limits of your clay. Doing it in VR helps though because you can freely spin your model while holding your warp. And here by holding I mean keep the grip button of your support hand pressed while warping so that you can move and warp the object at the same time. Here you really see the benefits of working on separate layers. I can build up complexity without messing with the base ornament. While I'm fiddling with these bands, I'd like to say a few words about this stylized lion's head that we are creating. It's actually called a Kirtimukha, and it's a very common figure in Hindu iconography. It's famously known as having a gaping mouth and no lower jaw, and you can find it in lots of places, but especially above entrances, doors, gate littles, and so on, because it's a guardian figure, and it suddenly makes sense to put it on a sword guard. It watches over your fingers while you are fighting. Anyway, I'm rambling, but I feel like it's important to get to know the meaning and functions of what you are trying to recreate. Now let's get back to our work. All we have to do now is to repeat the same process for each ornament. To taper the end of that band, I'm using the warp tool. Let me quickly explain how with an example. So the warp tool can be used to translate, rotate, and scale. And if you push the hardness to the max and make it big enough, you can basically use it to move things around. It also means that you can scale up and down parts of your clay while holding the warp, allowing for nice pinching effects like this. And I mostly use it to taper things out, like so. Now in the case of those bands, I might have tapered too much, because now I don't have enough clay to work with and I might get artifacts if I start twisting them too much. So to fix that, let's use the inflate tool, like so. Let's also not forget to save our project from time to time. Now that we have enough clay to warp, we can make that end swirl all right. Okay, so the stylized clown on the forehead are not so easy to make because they are very swirly. So we have to do it in several steps. Hopefully by now you spot the techniques that I already showed, like duplicating, tapering, warping. And with one wisp done, it's just a matter of copying and placing the other ones. Now, as I'm working on these ornaments, I realized that the forehead is not quite right. It lacks volume and contrast, so let's just copy in that layer and arrange it with a warp. As you can see, it's really a back and forth process between layers. Playing with the hardness to get sharper transitions. All right. It's finally time to give our creature its sight back. We do that by using a close enough primitive, for example, a sphere, not forgetting symmetry, and placing it roughly in the socket. All right. Now we need to give these eyes a proper shape by warping them. Eyes are super important because this is what will breathe life into our creature and give it its striking stare. And this lion has three of them, by the way. That's why I left that empty area in the middle of the forehead. Now if we take a look at our reference, you'll notice that the eyes and the face are actually one single sheet of metal. So what I'm doing here is that I start merging layers together. It might be a bit early in the process. Usually I would recommend to keep it till the last minute. But in that case, I want to ease them in the background using the smooth tool like so. Okay, so to shape the eyes a bit more, let's inflate 
the center where the iris is supposed to be. All right, a quick smooth pass to remove any stepping artifacts. Okay, then flattening the area back with the warp. Much better. Now it's time to drill out the pupils. Let's jump into Erase mode, where we can use parametric primitives just as in clay mode. In that case, cylinder will work just fine. Now that the eyes are in place, we can finish the ornaments around them using the same workflow as before. I really like those hollows on the temples. I'm going to carve them out using the eraser, this time with a muscle tool. Smoothing just a touch. This area will be really interesting to texture, I can't wait. Next up is an important part of the head, the jaw. We just have to warp it into place. Then for the fangs, that's super easy. Simply duplicate the jaw and pull the fangs out like so. Must be painful. Pushing the gums with a hard warp helps creating that bulge around the fang, which is perfect. And for the teeth, we can stamp little capsules along the jaw like so, and just adjust them afterwards with a warp. All right, we are now almost done. All that is left to do is to prepare our model for export. We can now merge all the layers that we feel belong to the same group. Just select them and press Merge in your tool palette. Select, Merge, Smooth and Repeat. We can now export our model and send it to Painter for texturing. So this is the options that will be presented to you in the export dialog. You can obviously choose the format. I'm going to stick with FBX for this one, but Modeler also supports USD. You can also decide if you want to export the whole project or just the selection. And the topology options are the most important. So Raw Triangle will export the actual model that you have in Modeler and give you a heavy high poly mesh with no optimization. Triangles and quads options do a remesh based on a target count, but more interesting is the UV mapped triangles option. It also does a remesh, but the quality is generally better and it also unwraps the UVs for you. I'm going to set my triangle count to something around a million to keep most of the details in and hit export. Now, before bringing that mesh into Painter, I need to make a short pit stop in Blender to assign texture sets. This isn't a necessary step, but it's best if you do it, especially for a complex mesh such as this one. We have a series on that topic if you want to know more about the importance of preparing your model for Painter. Basically, for each material assigned to the model, Painter will create a texture set, which will allow you to work with more textile density. So I'm doing it in Blender, but you can do it in any 3D software. And that's it. Our model is now ready to be textured, and I see you in the next video to show you how we can approach that.